So I'm Tal Doron. I'm an architect at Gigaspaces. I'm involved uh, in most of the upcoming projects. And I think it's the most wonderful thing to architect a solution, uh, building something from scratch, and well, hoping that one day seeing it go to production. That's amazing. So just a word, uh, Gigaspaces is also a vendor, a solution vendor, and actually a software vendor. Uh, we also operate in the world of in-memory computing alongside of many of our other esteemed colleagues. And we have uh, something a bit different, a multimodal store that operates in a distributed manner, and we'll also talk about that, which is also called XAP. And we have a more of a converged solution called Insight Edge, which actually converges um, analytical workloads on top of that uh, multimodal store, data fabric. So it's a really nice kind of one-stop shop solution. So customers, well, a lot of them, 74% want to be driven by their data. The hard reality is that only 23% are actually successful in implementing these kind of projects. So very often projects, they want to go somewhere. They start with a meaningful uh, architecture of being data-driven, event-driven, not always, or should I say in this case, most often they don't really succeed. Now, you might be asking yourself, why? Well. The reality is that building uh, overnight, over weekend, even intraday kind of systems, it's easy enough nowadays. You have your ETL tools, you have all kinds of different tools you can actually implement that and have a look behind or mirror effect over the data. Create reports, but the question is, what do you do about the real time? What happens when it's not enough to do things intraday? but move to the reactive, proactive, that phase of data analysis. And that's what we're going to talk about. And that's why we need this NLP solution. So my question to you before we start and dive in is, how many of you are technical people? Show of hands. How many of you could, would consider themselves with enough technical background? Perfect. Have you ever, with a show of hands, started solving a technical uh, problem without understanding the business use case first? How did that end? Well, Okay. But I can only assume somebody else understood the business problem, hopefully. Right. So the thing is... <laughs> well, we have everything from everything, but the point is that before starting any kind of uh, technical solution, we have to look and understand the business challenge, understand what we want to achieve. And I don't know if have any of you have seen the movie, but that's what we want to do. So understanding the challenge, understanding what we want to solve, comes before solving it, usually. And you know, some challenges are greater than others. You know, each one has its own challenges their own systems, their own platforms. And if we'd be looking a few years back, um, some of the numbers we would be facing, uh, fraud detection, 200 milliseconds to prevent fraud, uh, three seconds, people would wait up to three seconds until they would bounce off that page. Those numbers was, were accurate, what? Five years ago? People are now, they don't want to wait a second. Call center, 450,000 calls a minute. It sounds a lot, but it's not. That's also true four, five, six, seven years ago. 
data is accelerating, the volume, the velocity, the veracity, all the Vs. I don't know how many there are now. I think it's, they're, they're also growing. We started with four, and now there are six, seven, or eight Vs. So the customer. The customer that we had to solve a problem for was a financial organization, uh, actually, in Germany. I would say the, one of the leading companies. That sounds very marketing related, but it is. Um, they're a very big organization, and they had a problem. The problem didn't sound too complex. They wanted to enhance the customer experience uh, with first call resolution. And they also wanted to reduce average handle time, which is AHT, to both increase efficiency, increase customer experience, obviously goes without saying lower costs. So we kind of had a look at their systems, and we understood there are a few challenges there they had. They had multiple systems of I don't say records, but they had their CRM, they had other databases, and when there was a customer engagement, uh, the customer had to wait when the agent had to move from one system to another or retrieve different customer data, not to mention searching different databases. Another problem we've had is that customers are becoming smarter. They have more means to interact more means of getting more information, whether it's a web, uh, mobile tools, calling other people. They even have mobile phones. So the customers are way smarter. I don't know if the customers are smarter, but they have more means to get the data they want. And another thing, the customers, they, it's funny, but they want a consistent omni-channel experience. It doesn't matter if they're logging via their application, calling over the phone, sending an email. They want to feel as if it's the same process handling them, and not different people, different systems. From a technical point of view, they, or should I say, the, the, the bank needed a high-performing system that could iterate over millions of records. They need the ability to react in millisecond latency. And they also wanted a continuous machine learning training to train the model and replace it, deploy it in production without any downtime, seamlessly actually moving from development, testing, production. So it doesn't seem like they're asking for a lot, but, and, and it's not, but it does take some planning and effort. So what we had in mind and have implemented is a very simple solution. A customer would call in. The minute that customer would get their call answered. The agent on the other side would automatically get all the information he needs about the customer. That's an easy customer 360 use case. But more importantly, it would get the top five, top 10 similar cases, whether they were resolved or not, up to his choice, according to what the customer has without saying, hold on, wait a few minutes, I'll get back to you, somebody will call you. That's part of the customer experience. So how do we do it? Well, it's a good question. Let's start with how it would look. So we couldn't bring an actual screenshot, obviously, from the internal systems of the customer, but the idea is that the agent would have a very detailed screen with similar use cases, suggestions, um, case resolutions, everything that's related to the customer complaint. Now, if you're wondering if it's a powerful tool, the answer is yes. Any tool that you give to an agent to reduce their, uh, their average handle time, to increase customer satisfaction, is an amazing tool, anything. 
So what we did, we used a TF-IDF algorithm, which is, although basic, it's amazing. It's still being used in some 83% of engines that want to uh, index the data and actually find similar items in the databases or other data stores. Training a model was, or should I say, takes 27 minutes on 2 million records. And it's still not optimized. There's still a way to go and fine tune this. But for 2 million records, 27 minutes is quite a fast training time. Where in other systems, it could even take hours. And the most beautiful thing here is once a customer calls in, states his problem, speech to text, it takes under 50 milliseconds to bring the 10 most order by relevancy, similar cases, which even some of them might have resolutions, to the agent, simply pop it up on his screen. So the way we're actually doing it, and I'm allowing myself to go technical because you all raised your hands, kind of tricked you into that, but I will do that. So the data itself is in the CRM database. We've placed this nice black but or it's white box on top of it so we could actually fetch the data from the database so we can do all the operations on the data without impacting any performance of the database not to mention that we wanted well an in-memory computing platform to do it because um, I'm not saying databases are slow but we need something faster so we did initial load, we loaded the data, and let's kind of see the journey of what happens. ORM mapping, yes, databases are relational. Um, ORM is still part of the game here. Hopefully we'll be able to talk 10 years from now and not speak about ORM anymore. Maybe at some point, from what I'm seeing out there, Everybody will th start thinking and building their multimodal stores and talking objects, not in tables. Load the data. Train the model. So training. That part took us some time. And by the way, in most machine learning projects, that's where it takes most of the time. Not deployment not architecting, not high availability. It's, it's building the right model and training it. Now, the thing is that if it would take you two days, 20 hours, 12 hours to train a model, think of your development, your developers, your data scientists. They have to tr train something, see if it works, and by the way, for those of you that are not familiar with TF-IDF, um, it's an all or nothing. You need all of the data to train the model because everything is weighted um, against the data in the vector. So once we have a new document, we, ha we have to retrain everything. So you can't just train on 200 CRM cases and say, okay, this is, this is good, I'll take this now to production. You need all the data there. So instead of waiting for hours, doing a 2 million training on, for 27 minutes, that's a game changer. Our data scientists, our engineers, could actually do that throughout the day and not wait a whole day for the model to complete. What we actually have is a long-running Spark job waiting for data to arrive, fetching it, fetching the request. What is the request? Well, it's easy. Well, it's either we're training the model or we need to get the model, or if in production, we need to actually verify against the model. Now, Spark is running on top of the data in a in-memory computing system. 
And well, eventually we actually want to do what we came here to do. We want to find the similar items. So we need to write a similar request coming in from the client or the browser or some kind of other means. We need to write the request to the in-memory computing platform. We need to take that request, run it through the model, get the results, find the, uh, <laughs> the IDs of the results, show them to the agent, order it by top 10, by most relevant, and do everything in a few milliseconds. So this is what we got when we initially did the uh, find similarities, numbers, IDs. Obviously, getting those IDs in under 50 milliseconds and then going to the database, just the network IO would take too long. It doesn't make sense. We also have to keep or maintain the relevant data in the in-memory computing system. It keeps coming back to the fact that we have to do, to actually have, or so say, persist the data in the memory computing system. We have to run the logic there. We have to run the analytics there. We're seeing a trend that we can't rely on databases, which are usually disk-based or other disk-based platforms. We need those in-memory computing platforms. Development, testing, production, for everything. There's no way around it. Ultimately, the support tickets, that's where we fetch the actual data and we present it. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with application servers. I'm sure you're familiar with ETL tools. I'm sure you're familiar, hopefully, with databases. So what is Insight Edge? That's the million dollar question. So it's something very interesting. It actually gives you a distributed in-memory, multimodal store. And when I say multimodal, it's not a key value that could operate as something else. It's a truly multimodal. Um, the closest thing I have similar to this is an object store, uh, which is actually running in a distributed manner in memory. Yes, there are persistence capabilities to off heap RAM, disk, uh, anything from SSD all the way to obtain in others. But the fact is that we have that tier running and we have an analytical framework running on top of it. So we don't have that data shuffling between, in this case, Apache Spark and the data store. Even if there is data shuffling, it's memory to memory, it's the same servers. Remove the network IO, we're using data locality architecture. We're doing some neat stuff to get that performance, again, for development, testing, and production. So, and not only that, that customer also asks us, well, that's great. And you're right, we have only, only millions of records in the CRM database, but what happened in phase two when they need to access the historical data, which is not sitting on a small database? What happens when it sits on an archive tier in Hadoop? Or other customers, we see they ask the same questions with cloud storage. Well, we also have that integration tier, which is not the focus of this conversation, but I do want to mention that we have that uh, adapter or connector or however you want to call this design pattern uh, to actually integrate with that back-end tier, both on downstream and the upstream. So again, results. Average handle time, 50 milliseconds. And by the way, it doesn't matter if there were 2 million records, 6 million, 10 million, um, it would pretty much still stay 50 milliseconds. It only means that the training time would take longer. Empowering the agent. Now, 
that's something that many of us, that technical people, don't often think that whatever we develop or architect is actually being used by someone. What we have to think all the time, how do we help that someone who is using our solution and how do we optimize it for him? If it's giving him faster performance, simplified UI, it's the kind of things that as you know, 10 years ago as a, an R&D person, I would never think of that. But now as an architect, I have a better understanding seeing things move from nothing to everything. The continuous machine learning training. That's something that's not enough emphasis is being put. And I'm sure in the next couple of years, we'll see a lot more. Because it's not enough to train something. What we really want to do, and that is what we really want to do, is the continuous training, but not in a serial way, not waiting half an hour or an hour, two hours for the model to finish and then start training another model. Think of a multi-thread environment. What we really want to do, think of it as opening a thread or a process every 10 minutes, having this kind of cascade um, continuous machine learning training, having models which are always up to date. Some of the machine learning models are additive, so you can add things to your model. Very often, they're not. You need to retrain everything from scratch. Kind of like doing covariance calculations for the financial people here. So you might be asking, looks pretty much straightforward. What was the problem? Well, the first thing we had to do, we had to load two million records. Obviously, that's just for phase one. At phase two, we have to load, actually, funny enough, six million records. So we cannot interact with the database. Too much network I.O., low concurrency, and the database, it, it's not the right tool. So we just loaded everything to our platform. This is the engine underneath the hood. I'm sure you're familiar with, with this kind of picture from other platforms. Distributed, has both logic, data, messaging, everything built in within. Essentially, it's a microservices platform running underneath the hood. And we're pushing database to the background. Now, what we actually had to do is uh, save the model to the grid. Now, sounds straightforward enough. But before doing it, we, ha we actually thought of what others are doing. Well, most of them are saving it in Spark memory or on disk, too slow, no high availability, how to replace it in production. Um, it's not the right way to go. What we did do is actually persisted to the actual grid. So the model has built in out of the box high availability. If you need to replace it, simply replace it or add a model with a different version. So. That was the first challenge we had. Uh, and by the way, I'm not going to dive into it, but since we didn't use a standard MLib uh, model, um, we faced a few technical challenges we had to overcome. I'll give you a tip. Some of them, we, one of the ways we overcome it was using transient uh, annotation for the RDD's uh, properties. Those of you who know what it means, great. Those that not, different session. And the second thing, message broker, amazing tool. Whether it's Kafka, which I know is very common in big data architecture, or choose anything else do you wish. Anything from MQ, JMS, Rabbit, Zero, uh, pick your poison. Kafka is actually much more. It's, it's a risk streaming platform. It's much more than a message queue. Actually, it's not a message queue. 
It is great though, and every architect loves to put it in the architecture because it kind of removes the responsibility to shift it to somewhere else. But the thing about shifting responsibility is that it doesn't solve them. It's just you're saying it's somebody else's problem. Ultimately, it becomes your problem. Why? Because if a request would come in from a client, um, it would write, well, obviously, the request to Kafka. A long-running Spark job would take the request from Kafka, verify it versus the model, get the results, get the data, and write a response back to Kafka. We have this architecture we wanted to avoid. The architecture, well, it's not a lot, but we always want to avoid unnecessary moving parts. In this case, Kafka is not really necessary. Too much accidental complexity, and the worst thing, latency. That's the worst enemy we can have. So how do we avoid it? Well, every time a new request comes in, we write it directly to the grid. Nothing in between now. It's worth mentioning that we're an event-driven architecture, event-driven system, meaning you can actually register to events. You can register, you can take actions, you can have notifications, and that's what we used. So we removed Kafka. We have the Spark job running. We are not being notified of the event. Uh, we're actually running, we're taking the data from the grid, running it to the model, and imagine that we write it back to the grid. So we removed a lot of the latency there, but we still had a lot of remoting. So how can we avoid the fact that we still had a lot of, let's call it Java to Java uh, remoting? Um, it's a good question. So we've actually taken the client code, which would sit on another application, on the client application, and we've deployed it together. We wrapped it in a grid task or a processing unit, uh, serverless function. It has so many names, I'm not entirely sure who is using what. But the point is we actually deployed the logic together with the data for a stateful uh, service. So now we're of we reduced the remoting further. And we've added another cool thing. Although we didn't do it for this specific customer right now, we've added the capability of building models with IDs. So if that financial customer would have CRM data for one telco company or another telco company or this organization, it could build different models for different customers, put them on different partitions, and be able to route the actual request to the relevant partition. So everything would be running in a collocated manner. And again, running the Spark job directly from the processing unit, in other terms, from the service. In this case, it's a stateful service because it also stores the data in the state. And we even removed remoting even further because remoting is the enemy of latency. And I would say add production grade capabilities to Spark, that's pretty much what we're about. Not providing a plugin, but actually integrating Spark to run directly, I would say on top, but it's actually pushing on the predicates and running it together with Spark. That's added value here. So everything is running in a collocate manner the operations, the data, the logic, the analytics. And, and now we got everything out of the box. Monitoring, auto-scaling. Those of you who want to hear about auto-scaling, there's another Kubernetes session. 
Um, and all the production grade capabilities you would have expect from a platform to provide you. So I'm sure you're asking, okay, that's all great, but moving forward, what else the customer would be asking for? Well, we already know some of the things they want because we do have a two-year plan. Automated call routing using deep learning, automatic topic determination, automatic CRM case creation. That's where the customer is heading. And obviously we can't give the whole list, but there are another 20 different items. So similar cases was the first step, but it was a very important step. Now we got that uh, running. Here's kind of the bonus item, automated call routing. So we didn't implement it for that customer, but we did implement it for another customer. And funny enough, it's, it's a crazy notion. Once you do something once, you can use it again. I know I'm surprising everyone here in the room, um, but it, it is a good idea. Highly recommended, especially if you're writing code. Use the same methods. Write it in a composable way. So in this case, the call routing, still related to NLP, again, it's about increasing customer experience. You'll see that over and over, making everything faster. Again, reducing average handle time. Sounds familiar from somewhere? I hope so. It means they were listening to me. So. If you're familiar with this kind of systems, um, who is familiar with this kind of IVR systems? All right. I can only assume that those that didn't raise their hands either have never used a phone or are simply not familiar with the term. Um, who, with a show of hands, who has ever called and there was an answering machine saying, press one if you want to get this agent, press two for sales? Anyone ever face that kind of? All right, there we go. So it's a terrible thing to call and get that message because in most cases, you have to listen until the end only to understand that none of the options were the one you were expecting. And it always happens to me. It happened to me last week. And, and, and the worst thing is that it wastes your time. You press one, then you have another set of options. You press two. And then you realize, oh no, <laughs> I should have pressed three before, but I messed up. I have to restart from scratch. And there are all kinds of optimizations that try to help you with it. You can always press star and go back. You can, um, you know, and, and those optimizations are great. But the fact is, um, this kind of technology is a thing of the past. And a number for you. Because I'm sure if you're like me, um, you kind of press zero, hope to get to an agent that you will ask, okay, I have this problem, Who do, can you connect me to someone else? Not only you're wasting your time, you're wasting the company's time. These kind of systems cost a lot of money. Now, every minute that a customer is wasting on these systems, it's tens of thousands of dollars for the big enterprises that have that own these systems. So obviously, for everyone's sakes, we want to optimize it. Why do we want to optimize? Satisfied customer, again, I'm putting an emphasis on that. Reducing the average handle time, again, emphasis on that. And enhancing the overall system capabilities how about if we want to add a new category? We get, we're purchasing a new department. We want to add another number. Now, there is a problem that you have limited amount of numbers on your phone. What happens if I have a thousand different categories? Is someone going to wait and listen for a thousand options? No. Not to mention the fact that how long it would take to develop that. From a technical point of view, Performance, 
We all understand this has to be event-driven. We cannot wait for something to happen. It needs to be fast. It needs to be simple. And again, we need this kind of continuous machine learning in the background. Why do we need machine learning here? Well, because we know that the current architecture of these kind of systems doesn't work. We need something else. So the use case is very simple. Someone would call in, would actually say, I have a problem. My MacBook screen is broken, or I'm trying to present something at the conference, and it's not being recorded because of the refresh rate on the screen. What do I do? That's a pretty much straightforward question. Maybe if we were able to use it now, we could have solved that. But we don't. That speech is being automatically converted to text. That's an easy part. Any, your browser can do it for you. Now, that text has to be run against a model, or in this case, would be a neural network running in the background, probably taking that and using a word to vec kind of um, conversion, and then actually running it again, getting the relevant category, so it's a classification challenge, and routing the call to the relevant agent at the customer site. So how do we do it? So I didn't want to rely on internet, so I will skip the live demo, but we have that on our site, and if any of you, I can show you live demo afterwards, but it's quite easy. Speech to text, let's record something, have it run in under 50 milliseconds. Yes, I know 50 is a recurring number. And route it to the relevant category. Yes, you need a lot of text beforehand to actually train the model, which, by the way, we've used um, Intel's Big DL library to do that, to simplify the training, and to avoid using GPUs. You're asking, why would we want to avoid GPUs? Well, it's a valid question. The answer is very simple. Very much like, well, I don't have a Ferrari because I don't need to go that fast. Maybe I need. But the fact is, I'm driving on the road every day. I can't go that fast. So I can pay a tons of money for something I don't need, which, by the way, might personally work for me. But the fact is, we don't need GPUs for everything. It's not, it doesn't solve everything. It solves a very specific set of use cases, a very small one, and it's right for very big enterprises or small organizations that that's their focus. And it's also hardware. It's not scalable. It's not upgradable. If you're thinking about using GPUs in the farm, so GPU farms in the cloud, yeah, feel free. Pay a lot of money. Again, it might be the accurate case for some use cases, but not for this. Now, I'm not trying to say that GPUs are bad or, it's, or Intel has the only solution. But it's an interesting one. Check it out. I do believe it's um, open source, and there is an Intel's Big Deal team that you can also reach out. And they're doing quite an interesting job there. So the architecture is so simple that as an architect, I I'm ashamed to call this an architecture. Input, in this case, we did use a message broker because we needed restreaming capabilities. Inside Edge, which we're all familiar with, Spark job using the Intel Big DL library with the optimized math kernels and everything. Verify against the data, which is already sitting in our in memory multi model store. Get a result, bring it, well, connecting the call to the relevant agent, and that's it. 
50 milliseconds, the moment you finish speaking until the call is routed to the relevant agent, the relevant agent sees all the customer details on screen. And by the way, for this customer, we also recommended the similar items from, funny enough, another customer. Accuracy. If you're familiar with machine learning models, anything above 75, 80% is considered accurate. 85%, amazing. 90%, heaven. 100%, we'd all go out of business because that's not prediction anymore. That is knowing the future. But we're in the prediction now phase. Continuous training, 10 minutes, or in this specific case we demo it's even less, about seven minutes of training the model. And you can train it all the time in the background. Project-wise, you're asking how long did it took to build the initial pilot stage for this project? Um, a long time, 14 days. For me, it's a lot. I, I, I am. I like to do things in minutes, but no, but these projects usually take months of building. Yes, the actual production grade take a, took a bit longer, but um, the funny thing is that only the pink one, only the pink circle, that's what took longer. The speech to text, the spark streaming, the call session routing, the web, I mean, those parts pretty much stay the same. Most of the work was on the classification algorithm and optimizing it. It's great that once you build something, you know, build it once, use it over and over. So that's where the main focus was, and it freed up a lot of time for the engineers to do something else. So what do we have? I, I hate lists, but I couldn't find any other way to put everything in a list without doing a list. So unified machine learning, analytics, operations, transactions, um, event-driven architecture. Most of you are uh, familiar with triggers on a database. This is not triggers. This is event-driven. You can listen to what, whichever kind of event. You can filter. Um, it's really cool technology. Efficient scaling out, in, up, down. Distributed model training. Train different models on different partitions. Use different partitions. Use data from different partitions. It's, it's a numbers game. Decide what you want to do and choose the right topology to get you there. Lower TCO. I know that we're all technical people here, but the fact is that although we'd all love to plan the ultimate architecture, the ultimate platform, the ultimate system, um, money is of concern. Not only is it of concern, usually our managers or manage, manager's managers, that will be their primary concern. So as architects, technical people, we have to understand that what we're doing is not only efficient, but once we start scaling it, and that's the key thing here, we have to understand that once we scale it, it will still be efficient. We can scale it up, down, move it around from on-premise to hybrid cloud, multi-cloud. We have to understand that. And well, high performance. Um, I don't think without that would, it would be worth discussing any of this. Because if I would say this would slow performance, I think um, this whole session would be redundant. So I'd like to thank everyone for sitting here. I hope it was informative. And of course, I'll be around um, here, up there, probably for the food as well. And for any questions, um, I'm available. We can speak. And I'd be happy to answer anything. All right? 
Perfect. Thank you.